Yeah. Okay, you got you some break principles in physics. The various different parts here. This is some stuff from public domain stuff I got from Ford Motor Company because it's really good stuff. Brake lines, brake booster, parking brake, which is not really accurate because usually there's cables doing that, but they show funky mechanical linkage here. Got drum brake, brake pedal, disc brake master cylinder. The drum brakes are kind of making a comeback a lot of times, people. All right. You got kinetic energy. You know, who knows what kinetic energy is? Kinetic energy is energy that's actually happening. Kinetic energy is what's going on right now. Something's moving, that's kinetic energy, right? Okay, they're going to turn the kinetic energy into heat energy because your brake linings are going to contact the discs and rotors and they're going to get hot and they're basically causing the kinetic energy to, be, to go away, slowing the car down. They use mechanical and a hydraulic system and brake fluid is used to transfer pressure from the brake pedal to the wheels and, there, and the reason you can snake a brake line down there I thought there was an interesting uh, 51 uh, Hudson that my buddy had over there and it had actually a mechanical backup system so that if the hydraulics failed they could have a mechanical to follow up that was back in the 50s right uh, the brake components use that to apply the friction to the wheels and they slow and stop them. Park brakes are cable actuated and connect only to the rear wheel. Now, uh, there's 2,000 pounds of pressure that's going through your brake line. If you mash that brake good and hard, you get a couple of thousand pounds of pressure. It's really important that you remember that because when you're using brake lines, when you're repairing brake lines, you need to make sure you do it with a double flare and, uh, and the right kind of fittings instead of just trying to put it together. This, who was that? One of these guys. You were saying somebody put some rubber hose. They just cut the line and put some rubber vacuum hose to carry the brake fluid. <laughs> yeah. but, um. Okay, so you got you got power, you got weight, you got velocity. That's kinetic energy. You got power pushing that weight along, and when it's moving, there's actually kinetic energy in play there. Potential energy is like the rock sitting on top of the hill, you know, or something like that. Okay, so here you got your heat energy that's being created, and heat, heat, heat energy is making it move. And it's converted back into heat energy whenever you're stopping the car. So to make the car go and to make the car stop, you got heat energy. However, the brakes have got to be more powerful than what pushes the car because, you know, zero to 60, you're talking about, you know, 10 seconds. But from zero to 60, I mean, from 60 to zero, you need to stop a lot faster than you can go. I can do it in four seconds. You remember what I'm saying? Yeah, with your motorbike, you know. Now your brake pads are pinching the rotor. Uh, the brake pads don't pinch the rotor very well if you leave bolts loose. You know this kind of thing. They make sure you uh, don't you don't forget to tighten things up. Remember this little thing out on the wall. Don't ever start important bolts and walk away thinking you'll remember to tighten them later. I don't care if it's an oil drain plug or anything else. Just make sure that you don't let that fall don't fall in that trap. You got your traction. It's going to vary with road surface and tire condition. Better traction improves vehicle braking powder. The better the tires are biting the road, the better it's going to stop. And just about everybody in here that's driven on ice is slid oh, yeah. and all that. So whenever you slide, what does it feel like? When you're sliding, it feels like you're picking up speed, doesn't it? Yep. I mean, whenever the wheels lock up, it's like you're all of a sudden going faster. And furthermore, if you're in a dead slide and you don't have anti-lock brakes pulsing brake fluid to the wheels, you're going to feel like you can't steer it either because you'll turn the wheel and it'll keep going the same direction. And that's pretty scary when you're headed towards something you don't want to hit. All right. Equal brake force side to side. Equal brake force side to side. But you've got to balance it front to back. Why? If you've got your, uh, if you've got something heavier in the back than in the front, or you've got the front heavy because of the engine, see, whenever you hit the brake, ever, the front wheels are going to need to do most of the braking. If I'm on a pickup truck, and I'm going around the curve. Let's just say that I've built my own brakes. And let's just say that I've put me some a master cylinder and I've put me some brakes on all four wheels that are all just alike. And I, I just snaked me some brake lines to all of those wheels. Just run the lines to it, you know, run it through little T's and all that kind of stuff. All right, and then I'm driving this thing. I, I drive it and I stop and all. And I notice that when I stop, you know, the car rolls to the front and the back wheels are kind of wanting to slide on me. And that's not so terribly bad as long as you're not going around a curve, but you head around a sharp, like when we're here at Enterprise, there's some pretty steep curves. 
Okay, you're headed around a curve and all of a sudden you realize you're coming up in front of a, behind another car and it's going uh, faster, slower than you are. And yeah, maybe they've slowed down a lot. When you hit the brake going around a curve and the, right, and the back wheels begin to slide, what happens? Yeah. You've got to do a spin or you're going to have to turn right to go left and all that. You know what I'm saying? So the long and the short of it is we want to make sure that we don't let any brake pressure get to the back until the front have applied to a certain amount. Yeah. It's the same thing with like a motorcycle because you can actually control the front brakes and the rear brakes. Mm -hmm. And if you rely too much on those front brakes, you'll lift the back end up. Yeah, you will. And uh, so on this one here, on these vehicles, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we balance the braking from front to rear. Now we don't want the brakes to be unequal from side to side, but from the front to rear it's going to need to be balanced, right? Okay, the side to side braking force is going to be the same. Now this is Pascal's law. Everybody needs to have some understanding of Pascal's law. Not that you're going to use it when you're fixing the brakes, but basically what you're looking at here, you've got 12 pounds of force on a 12 square inch piston. You got 48 square inches, which is four times as much. So you're going to multiply when you're going through that connecting tube. 12 pounds of force will lift 48 pounds of weight over there because of the extra area. That's what Pascal's law is all about. You use it in automatic transmissions as well because you got piston surfaces got various different uh, square inches, or rather square millimeters or whatever. Also, you've got space considerations here. If you move this one inch, you're only going to move that a half inch because this is twice the size of that, right? You got it? So this uh, an inch here is going to translate to a half an inch there, but it's going to be twice as much force, say 100 pounds to 200 pounds. Okay? You might also notice that your brake pedal it's got a long arm with a paddle on it, and right up here at the top you got the hinge, and right close to the hinge is where the push rod goes into the master cylinder, and that multiplies your force too because of the leverage you're able to put, and then your brake booster is going to help you some more. So you're putting a ton of pressure on those, uh, well, a ton would be 2,000 pounds, I guess. Okay, you can have pinched or leaking brake lines, you can have kinked hoses. Heard a story one time true story about this guy that was working at a gas station and I worked at a gas station years ago and people would come in there and they want something done right quick to their car and he said this guy just pulled right in on the lift and he raised the car up and he says I've got a leaking wheel cylinder but I know what to do about this it was a little Studebaker or something so he just beat the brake line flat with a hammer going to that particular hmm. one and then whenever he went to back out of the shop he went right on down into the ditch <laughs> and so the guy came out and says, what's going on? And the guy says, I don't know what's wrong. The first three times I did this, it worked just fine. <laughs> so he had bent his last one flat, and he had a good storm pedal, but no brake fluid making it. Okay, you got your master cylinder. You notice right here, you got your little anchor point up here. And you see how far that is down there? And that's pretty well drawn uh, correctly. All right, you got your master cylinder here. And it's pushing this step to pinch the disc on the front. And then in the back you got these wheel cylinders, pistons, and links, and all that. And uh, also, something else, let me say while I'm thinking about it, when you're working on rear brakes, make sure that you have them adjusted properly so that they're really, really close to the, uh, to the drum. Like if you, here's an example, if I, you can actually put a set of brake shoes on and do everything right as far as putting your springs and mounting the shoes right, but if you don't adjust those shoes out really, 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 really close to the drum, you're going to have a lousy pedal. You may have to hit it two times to get a good stop out of it. You want that thing to just, those pedals, those brake shoes should actually be scrubbing, just faintly scrubbing the drums that really, really, really close. And whenever they match the shape of the drum, you got a really uh, nice little deal here. Here's your brake fluid. There's dot three, there's dot four, and there's dot five. Right? Now, one of the dot five, I believe it is, has got silicone in it. You don't ever want to use silicone brake fluid with uh, anti-lock brakes because it whips into a foam and you wind up with a bunch of air you didn't have before when those little uh, isolation and uh, valves are bouncing and everything. Here's your uh, reservoir cover, your gasket, diaphragm, whoopee, we know about that. This right here, what's this part right here? Fluid level sensor. Hey, bro. Yeah, you coming? All right, well, I'll see you close to lunchtime. I just wanted to remind you to come. I will. I'll do that.
Yeah, typically. But uh, be over here about uh, uh, 11 o'clock and I'll find Tim so he can show you the car. That's all right. We'll just uh, we don't have to we don't have to call in the order ahead of time. We can just order when we get there. Yeah. But anyway, I'm in class right now. Until we finish what we do. That's fine. That works. That's the fluid level switch, y'all. Right there, fluid level switch. This is a float that goes up and down. Whenever this goes down, that fluid level switch actually turns on the red brake light. And this right here is coming in from the rear brake pedal, and it's going to push this. And there's a spring between these pistons and all that. And I'm going to show you in a little bit how that kind of thing works. These little uh, cups right here have got a particular you know, job that they do. You notice you got two particular reservoirs here. One of them goes to the front and the other one goes to the back. Uh, and these, they'll usually be two different sh uh, sizes, the front and the rear. That little screw is visible from the outside of the master cylinder and you have to take that out to get that stuff out of there. Years ago when I first started in this business, back in 40 years ago or whatever, we used to rebuild master cylinders. And every time we did brakes, one of the standard things you did on particularly on drum brakes is you rebuilt the wheel cylinders. You'd hone them out and you'd put new cups in them. The guy that I worked for had just various different sizes of cups up there. You'd use the same springs and everything. You know, he wouldn't have boots to fit every one of them, but usually the boots were okay. Let me tell you this while I'm thinking about it. Whenever you're checking rear brakes, pull the drums off. If you're going to look at the, pull the, the boot back with your thumb and see if you see any brake fluid. If it's wet inside that boot, those wheel cylinders need to be replaced. We replace them these days instead of rebuilding them because they don't cost about eight or ten dollars, and they're just not that much to do in it. I mean, you know, you got to deal with the lines and the, you know, bolting them on and taking everything off. Now, you got a front and rear split, you got a diagonal split. That's the kind of the configurations that we're dealing with here. You see that? And it's important that you know how to do that. Now, uh, everybody has the idea. Is anybody is anybody here not bled brakes? You know, if you hadn't bled any brakes, you know, usually the standard procedure is starting at the right rear, which is the farthest one from the master cylinder, then go to the left rear, then go to the right front, and do the. That's not true on every vehicle. You know, Gene Taylor drives this uh, Nissan that he's got. He's not the little Mazda he drives, but he's got a nicer pickup truck that he drives sometimes. And he had to have some crash damage fixed on it because somebody pulled out in front of him and him and Lisa ran into him and tore the front of it all to pieces. It was really a brand new truck at the time. So there was a bunch of work had to be done on it, but they did a good job. But he said the brakes never felt right after they did that. They just never felt right. And so we got it up here for some reason or another. We decided we were going to fool with those brakes. And so I looked at the procedure for bleeding the brakes on that Nissan pickup of his, that Titan, I guess it is. And, or it may be a Frontier, I don't remember, but the long and the short of it is that white Nissan he's got. And the brake bleeding order was weird. Something you would never have expected and it didn't follow that old, you know, right rear, left rear, right front, left front. It actually was a totally different order. And when we bled it according to the way that Nissan said they were supposed to be bred, they were rock hard and perfect. Well, they never had felt right because the people, probably in the body shop, did the plain old standard pattern. So make sure that you know how the things are supposed to be bled before you do, before you, uh, do that. Now this is what's going on inside there. See your little compensating port, uh, your fluid inlet port. See how that, whenever you push that, uh, this is basically <coughs> going to go past that and when it traps that fluid, it goes in front of it. When you release it, this, this little uh, thing is made to roll back and let fluid pass around that. You see what I'm saying? Now, that's not all that complicated. You're, you may see something about this on an ASD test or something like that. You don't necessarily have to know about this to fix the brakes. How many of you have ever seen a bad master cylinder? How would you tell them a master cylinder was bad? Besides the fact that it's leaking. It's not building up pressure. Well, what if you hit the brake and it feels good when you initially apply the brakes, but the longer you keep your foot on the pedal, the more it falls from under your foot. That's a bad master cylinder just about every time. You got it? Now, uh, this one guy came in here 
uh, with a Dodge pickup. It was a full-size Dodge pickup. And he said, I always have to add fluid to my master cylinder all the time. But I haven't seen any leaks anywhere. And we looked at all four of the brakes, you know, the calipers and everything and weren't leaking and neither were the rear wheel cylinder, but he kept having to add brake fluid. And it turned out it was going into the brake booster. It was going out the back of the master cylinder and when we pulled the brake booster off of that truck, we poured about a quart and a half of fluid out of it. Wow. We had to put a master cylinder on. We couldn't see that and didn't know it until the actual uh, inside of the booster got so full of fluid that the booster wouldn't work anymore. <laughs> and then, there was no wet, you couldn't see anything wet anywhere. So, but when you pull the master cylinder off of that booster and you shine a light in there, you'd see the brake fluid puddled up in there. Wow. So I haven't, seen, that's the first time I've ever seen that. I mean, I'm sure that other people have. When the brake pedal is applied, the piston and the cup move down the cylinder. As it moves, fluid pressure increases in front of it, and that's what they're showing right here. Uh, fluid's trapped in front of the piston and is forced along the cylinder's bore into the pressure chamber. As it moves, the return spring is compressed, and there's your return spring. When the pedal is released, the force of the spring moves the piston toward where it was when, before you started applying the brakes. As the piston moves back down the cylinder bore, the edge of the cup distorts and it lets fluid pass and it acts as a one-way valve. That particular uh, piston cup acts as a one-way valve. It lets fluid go one way but not the other. Right? Okay, you got your brake rotary disc here, you got friction material there. Got a brake drum, and your brake drums can be worn out in all different ways. You know, you can have them barreled and you can have them, you know, tapered and all that. Here, right here, is your piston seal, your dust boot, and your pads, and the bolts that sometimes get left loose when somebody, you know, drops the ball on that. Okay, now right here, uh, this particular screw right here, I mean, this bleeder screw, uh, one of the things that I used to do that was kind of mean when I first came here, I, when I, especially if I have somebody in here that thinks they know, it's hard to teach anybody that thinks they already know everything. You know what I'm saying? I mean, in the military, you got to run into that, didn't you? Especially if you get on a firing range and some yo-yo that's been a deer hunter all his life, you're trying to teach him to shoot an M4, and he thinks that he knows more than he does. <laughs> you know, and the girls that are don't know how to shoot, they're hitting the target every time, and this guy don't know nothing because he thinks he can shoot a deer rifle and all that. Long and short of it is, what I would do is I would take my brake caliper on the Ranger, and I would go from one side to the other. I'd put the left one on the right and the right one on the left. What does that do? They'll fit just fine, but the bleeder's on the bottom. If the bleeder's on the bottom, the air is always at the top, and you'll never bleed them. And I had one guy that worked and worked and worked and worked and worked for most of a day, and I said, did you ever consider the fact that the bleeders are on the bottom, and where's the air going? Think of it, the air's going to go to the top of that caliper. Yeah. And occasionally you'll run into one that somebody was in a hurry to get it out of the shop, and they'll actually put the... Uh, caliper, a right hand caliper on the left hand side of the car and they'll actually bleed it by leaving it loose and bringing it up and then putting it back down in place. You know what I'm saying? So that they can actually get the car going. But the next guy, who you didn't really think about a whole lot, doesn't know that and they work and work and work and work. But always pay attention. This bleeder screw needs to be on the top. If it's not, somebody's either put the wrong caliper on or they got them on backwards. Now, something else that's important. These locating pins that the calipers have to float. And what I mean by that is they need to be able to move freely back and forth. A lot of times you'll see, and I have a picture I should have posted, where the one on the piston side, the, the shoe on the, I mean the pad on the piston side will be worn completely out, and the one on the other side will have almost full lining because the caliper couldn't float. And the only one that was really doing a lot of the stopping because the caliper was locked up is the one in front of the piston. You got me? So don't ever look at just one of the, of the brake pads and say, oh, these, I fell in that trap eons ago. I looked, I just glanced, and I could see with my flashlight that the outer pad was fine, but the inner one was worn almost completely out, and the guy that pulled the tires off and looked at it found something I had missed made me look silly. See, so don't go there. Okay, so here you got your dust boot. This is whenever it's applied, right? Applied, release. All right, wait a minute. Yeah, okay, there you go. See, this is actually pushing out. I'm going to try to make sure these words weren't backwards. This is pushing out. You see how that square seal that's going around that piston is distorted? That square seal actually acts as a return spring, and as soon as you release this square seal, it's going to pull that piston back, as peculiar as that seems. So just remember that that's how that works. Okay, you've got a vented rotor. 
And then you've got solid rotors. Usually the solid rotors are the ones that are in the back. You won't usually see non-vented rotors in the front. Uh, what you do see sometimes, if somebody lets the brakes wear out enough, you'll see the pads just come out of there. Anybody in here ever see that before? Any, Quincy, have you ever seen that? You have. You had some experience with that, didn't you? Okay. And so, all right. All right, here's the moving caliper. Oh, let me say something else while I'm talking about brakes, too. Uh, let's say that somebody uh, comes and you give them an estimate on fixing their brakes. Let's say that you're in a position to do that or somebody, maybe the service rider or whatever. And you get this thing in the shop and you get it jacked up and you get it and you realize that half of the hardware is missing and that it's all haywired together and it's not put, it's just put together in a total disaster and a bunch of, you know what I'm saying, it's just, when you look at it, it's amazing that the trouble is even stopping. Okay, let's say that you get this thing up in the air and you get it torn down and then you find out they're going to need this and this and a hardware kit and these other things and all that. What if they say no? What do you do then? Now, every, every shop's got their own procedure, but I will tell you what better not happen. You better not put it back together like you found it and let them drive out of there because you were the one with the hands on it last and if they crash, see, the best way to do it is keep the wheels off of it, disable it so it can't be driven, and say, this car is not leaving unless you get a wrecker to come get it because we're not going to put it back together unless we do it right. You know what I mean? We've had stuff like that happen here. And they, you know, they went ahead and let us fix it, but they didn't like it. And what happened, she asked me, how much is it going to cost? And I called the parts store. He didn't ask any questions. And I said uh, about the front rotors. And he said it's going to be $22 a piece for the front rotors and all that. We got it torn down. Well, she was missing a bunch of parts. It was horrible. And so I got it torn down and found out this thing had any lock brakes. And the rotors that they sent weren't going to work. And it was going to be $50 a piece for the rotors instead of $22. And the price went up. And she needed a hardware kit. And she was screaming and hollering on the phone. But when it left here, it was just like it was supposed to be. Everything was in place. She didn't like the size of the bill, but she'd a whole lot been, she'd been a whole lot better off, you know, that way. Anyway, your caliper is kind of like a C clamp, right? And it's actually pinching the rotor. You see how that works? Your, I mean, that's why they call it a caliper because it's sort of like a, a C clamp, which in a way is a sort of a caliper. Now, who has seen one of these? That's the rear caliper that has the park brake built in. Anybody we seen that? We just had one of those the other day. And then, then what happened? Which one was that? You had to screw the pistons back in. Oh, yeah, that, uh, Remember that? that? Okay. Yeah. See that? See the threaded part? You got little balls in there. And whenever you apply the park brake, these little balls roll out of their dimples and it tightens the, it, they use the pads for the park brake. I do not like that. I've never liked that. I think it's a bad idea. And, uh, and it, because, you know, having to screw those things back in is a pain. I mean, they weren't that bad on that late model vehicle. Yeah. All right. So right here, we got a rotor hat. And we got parking brake shoes. And we got your service brake pads. Service brake pads being they're the ones that stop the car. They got nothing to do with the park brake, though. Uh, what vehicles can you think of that have this? Trucks. Late model Chevy pickups have it, right? Also, your uh, Crown Victorias have got it. A lot of them, a lot of the Fords have got these. These little park brake shoes, though, when you're doing the rear brakes, like on a Chevy pickup, it won't have two shoes. It'll have one shoe that's in, a, a shoe that's in one piece and goes all the way around and has to be changed. And just about every time you do the rear brakes on one of those Chevys, those park brakes will be wore out and you need to replace them, too. Isn't that hard to do? When you pull it off, there they are. See that rotor hat? That's why they call that a rotor hat because it's got a miniature brake drum in there. And that is a great way to do park brakes. Some of the medium duty trucks that I used to see would have a park brake, I mean a drum brake on the back of the transmission that would stop the drive shaft from turning. You've probably seen that on some of your military oh, yeah. equipment. And, uh, that's okay unless somebody has cut the drive shaft. <laughs> and then you're going to roll away. Um, how many of you have heard of a brake lock? where you throw a lever and pump the brakes up and it holds the fluid out there. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, is that something like bus do or something? Like some of them do, yeah. Some of your industrial stuff does that. And we had a, a, a Lodestar International that had an 8 liter diesel engine in it. And that son of a gun, uh, we had a 
Uh, they had me put one of those brake locks on it, a micro brake lock, and you flip this lever down there, but it, it had the brake lines going through it, and it would let the brake fluid go out of the wheels, but you stomp on them really hard, and they were just locked down. And these mud pumpers that were borrowed that truck from the shop to do some kind of work they needed to use the pump for tried to drive off with that micro brake lock, and they busted one of those big axles. And those axles in the back of that truck were, my gosh, they were like two and a half, three inches in diameter, and they popped one of those rear axles because that, that diesel engine was so strong. They found the weak link in the chain. Okay. <laughs> right here we've got the little rubber boots right here. The fluid comes in here, pushes this out. Whenever you're putting those brake shoes on, like the ones we got on this uh, stand out there, you're going to see these wheel cylinders. Really important that you pay attention. That's what I was talking about. You pull this boot back when you're looking at and inspecting the rear brakes. To begin with, you pull it off. It's covered with that black dust that will give you cancer if you breathe it a little bit and the visophilioma and all that hot wash. So the first thing I want to do with that, if I don't have anything else, I'm going to pour some water on that and wet all that dust because wet dust can't fly. Right? Brake parts cleaner works well, but don't breathe that stuff in because it's like smoking 10,000 cigarettes and it's not near as much fun. You got me? All right, so you spray that stuff on there and then wash all of that off. Make sure that it's washed off. Don't ever take an air hose and go shh and blow that dust into the air. I came in here one day and I was preaching that in this don't ever blow brake dust out of a brake drum. First thing the guy did when we got out of the shop, shh, just blew the brake dust off of there. I don't know what in the world he was thinking about or when he did that or wasn't listening or whatever. That, uh, any, like a clutch, too. All this asbestos stuff, breathing that dust, is bad news. You're better off to look like a wuss and have something covering up your nose than you are to breathe that stuff. Got me? All right. Now, these right here, look at your question on your test, you guys. Leading trailing brakes are the ones that you usually see on the back of a front-wheel drive vehicle. You got me? And duo servo brakes are the ones like we've got on the stand out here that you're usually going to see on the back of a rear wheel drive vehicle. Like the Bronco out there has got duo servo brakes. And on the duo servo brake, the front shoe has got the short lining. The front shoe moves around and energizes the rear shoe, which has got the long shunt lining. It goes against that post and it does most of the stopping. This particular one, you got your lead and trailing brake. It's anchored solidly at the bottom and the adjuster is up here. You got that? Okay, your adjuster on this one is down here. So if you see the adjuster at the top, that's pretty much going to be a leading trailing, and both of the linings will usually be the same. Usually. Now, there will be hardware issues and stuff like that, and there's your, you got a park brake lever over there. All right, here you go. This is right here. The leading shoe makes contact with the drum, and it pulls the leading shoe more tightly against the drum. The trail and shoe makes contact with the drum, but the rotation of the drum forces the shoe away. Uh, so basically, it's, you know, that's the way those leading trailing brakes work. Now this one here, on your duo servo, that one, see that short, shorter lining goes against it, it rotates, it pushes that back against the drum, and that goes against the post. That's basically how that works. The movement of the primary shoe forces the secondary shoe into the drum there, and so there you go. Always put the shoes with the short lining to the front. You got it? Don't put those on there. One time I was putting brakes on and I knew this and I wasn't thinking about what I was doing. I put it on back. All right. This one guy told me that this Cajun guy that he knew called and he says that he had a, a Chevrolet truck that had drum brakes all the way around because it was an older Chevrolet truck. And he says, when I drive this thing and I hit the brakes, I go back where I come from. <laughs> he said, I don't know what you're talking about there. So he goes and he gets in the truck and he heads off down the street. He says, as soon as I mash the brake, the truck does this. <laughs> slides around, does a 180. As he, when he pulled all the wheels off, he had put the short shoes on the right front, the left rear, and the long shoes on the left rear, right front. So basically, he had really good brakes, better than he needed on two wheels, and lousy brakes on the other ones. All right. Okay. Now then, you got a neural pin here. These are adjusters. This is a one-shot adjuster. What you mean by one-shot adjuster is when you put these things on here and you mash the brakes one time, the way it sticks, they go and they're done. You got it? One-shot adjuster means you, unless they're a long way, I'm talking about if there's a ton of distance between there, uh, basically you're going to see a couple of little knurled wheels up on the top on the one-shot adjuster cutter. 
Okay, so that's basically what you see on this one here. That's a pretty cool deal that somebody came up with, that one shot adjuster. Adjust the clearance uh, at a single apl application, unless the distance is really large and then it takes more shots. Okay, here's your anchor pin. You've seen this before, the trailing incremental adjuster. This one here just screws out the little uh, threads on that little adjuster slowly screws out. The, the coolest one that I ever saw was Volkswagen for years. I mean, I worked at a Volkswagen dealership for back in the early 80s, and they had a wedge with little teeth on the side of it, a spring pulling it down, and as the brake pads wore out, that little wedge would click down in there and it would hold them out. When you got ready to take it off, you took your little bolts out because you had bolts and not nuts, and you could just stick your screwdriver in there because you knew where it was, and you just pry it up, and you go, and you just pull the drum right off. Well, on this one here, you got to go through that adjuster hole in the bagging plate, push this adjuster away from that thing because it won't let that wheel turn backwards. You got to push it away from it and then turn the wheel backwards with a brake spoon. Now, it's not that bad if you've done it a few times, but if you're not, con if you get confused, you'll tighten those shoes up so tight you can't even turn the drum. But you'll have to do that because of the way the drum wears. You won't be able, and the rivets may dig into the drum. You won't be able to get the drum off sometimes unless you adjust them in, and that's just sort of a pain. That's something you'll have to deal with on drum brake. All right, here's your adjuster lever right here. It's an incremental adjuster, kind of like the uh, leading trailing head, but it's up here at the top. Once again, if you see the adjuster at the top, then you'll, and it's anchored at the bottom, you'll know that's leading trailing. The duo servo is the one where the bottom swings, right? Now, this is a brake booster right here. Most people don't even think about how a brake booster works. But basically, you've got atmospheric pressure that is allowed to play on the back of this diaphragm. And whenever you mash the brake, this little spool valve moves, and it basically allows atmospheric, well, it allows a pressure differential to develop between the front and the back, because you got vacuum here. But until you mash the brake, you got vacuum on both sides of this thing. And when you mash the brake, the atmosphere comes in from behind here and helps you apply the brake. So, uh, huh? Yeah, engine vacuum, that's right. Okay, so there it is in the release position. There it is in the applied position. You see the difference. Look at where it's what it's talking about. Okay, it's in the release position. You got a vacuum port that's open. All right. Wait a minute, that punched the wrong button. There you go. You see that? The vacuum port closed. You got atmosphere. You closed the vacuum port right there, and you let atmosphere come in here, and the atmosphere is now pushing on the back of this great big diaphragm. Why do you think this brake booster is so large? It needs a lot of area, doesn't it, in order to help you a lot. So if you want a lot of PSI, how many PSI is on the back of that? 14. 14 and a half at sea level, right? And on the front of it, what do you have? Zero. Well, what you've got is you've got like 22 inches of vacuum on the front, and then you've got atmospheric pressure on the back. There it is whenever it's being held. You don't have any fresh atmosphere coming in, and you don't have any fresh, you know, anything changing there. So you can basically see, see that? I actually did that. Now, you've also got hydraulic power steering, I mean, a hydraulic uh, brake booster on the ones that use the power steering pump to provide that. Uh, there's something else that some of the vehicles, some of the Lincoln LSs and some of the Jaguars, have a hydraulic cooling fan motor, and they use power steering fluid to operate the cooling fan motor, which is totally crazy and bogus, but they do that. Uh, hydraulic brake boost system, it's the same function as a vacuum assist, but it uses hydraulic pressure supplied by the power steering pump, and it's available, it can provide a greater amount of boost than vacuum assist because on the power steering system, you got 12 to 1,500 pounds of hydraulic pressure that's being produced by that pump. All right. Okay, it receives pressure from the power steering pump. It circulates hydraulic fluid through the booster freely at minimal pressure. The booster contains a brake booster valve with a movement of the valve acts on the fluid moving through the booster. It causes the valve to control fluid flow so that it creates boost. That's not so terribly big of a deal. I will tell you this though, they use in order to make sure that you've got boost when you need it, they'll actually have an accumulator and they'll have a nitrogen gas capsule in here and it can have like 2,000 pounds of pressure in it. And uh, they'll have this nitrogen capsule on some of these ABS systems and it looks like a sort of a ball shaped thing that's sticking up. And if you screw that out of there when it's got all that pressure on it, if you have a, if the ABS system has pressured that thing up, if you screw it off, it can come off there like a cannonball and take your head clean off. 
So what you basically got to do on one of the APS systems that's got one of those nitrogen ball things is you pump it about 20 or 30 or 40 times with everything shut down to make sure that you release all that pressure. This particular one is not one of those. But you got the, see the power steering pump? And there's your power steering gear where it's helping you steer it. But you got this one here, you got an accumulator here, then you got your hydro boost unit, and the hydro boost unit is what's helping you match the brakes. That's a safety feature right here. The accumulator provides boost for one or more brake applications should hydraulic pressure be lost. How many brake applications do you have that are powered if your engine shuts off on a vacuum system? Like one, usually you got a power assisted, right? All right. Okay, now then, you got a proportioning valve that's used to regulate brake force on the rear brake system. A metering is used to equalize hydraulic pressure on vehicles that use front disc and rear drum brakes. Remember those, burn that in. It's really important that you remember the difference between a metering valve and a proportioning valve. Okay, somebody read that aloud for me. The proportioning valve is used to regulate brake force on the rear brake system. Now, remember what I was telling you? how you want the front wheels to do most of the stopping. You don't want the back ones getting any fluid until the front ones have applied to a certain degree. The metering valve is equalizes hydraulic pressure on vehicles that use front disc and rear drum brakes. It's very similar in, in uh, function to what these things do. So, you know, since drum brakes and disc brakes don't operate with the same kind of efficiency, you've got to do some metering there. All right. Some of them have got a combination of valves where they put them both together. You got a proportioning valve and a metering valve. So you have the little thing here. Here's your master cylinder going in there. You'll see these little things on these vehicles. Uh, and I've actually, let me tell you about this one. We had this uh, um, 2002 uh, Chrysler Sebring. And it comes in and the rear brake, uh, uh, the disc brakes in the rear is rusty. I mean, they're just plumb rusty. What does that mean? If they're disc, yeah, huh? They haven't been used. There hasn't been any uh, brake application in the rear, yeah. Now she just, she wasn't really noticing anything except saying, why is my rear brake rusty? Well, it turned out that this valve was bad and it wasn't letting any pressure go back there. I don't think I've seen but one or two of those in my whole career. They don't usually go bad. Uh, you know, then your ABS system actually is, is integrated with this. I mean, it's all a part of it. Now what's this back here? What's the purpose of this dirt thing? And you've probably seen these on vehicles. Yeah, some some cars have them, some pickups have them. If, the, if you load stuff heavy, they mechanically change the position of that high sensing proportioning valve and let more brake pressure go to the rear brakes. Because if it's really heavy back there, you don't want to not have pressure back there, see? That's the thing. So you, remember, you got if you look under the back and you see brake lines going through a little valve and it's got this funky lever and spring that's hooked to the suspension, that's a high sense of proportioning valve. It's something, how many of you guys have walked up under a car or opened the hood on a vehicle and looked under there and didn't know what you were looking at? You know what I mean? You're looking at it and you're thinking, well, I don't know what that is. Well, what I would like to see happen before you're done here is for you to be able to, with about 90% accuracy, look at something and tell me what it's there for. Off the top of your head, I might say, what's that? And you'll say, well, that's the yeah, air control. What's this? Well, that's the, you know, proportioning valve for the brakes. What's this little thing in the brake line here for? Well, that's so on and so forth. I mean, you will be able to look at this stuff and tell what it is. Now your proportionate shuttle valve it regulates the amount of braking provided to the rear wheels. It's a safety valve that provides full pressure to the rear brakes if the front brakes develop a leak. It's important. We want to have full pressure back there if the front ones are leaking. Now you may go into a power slide, but at the same point it's better to be able to go into some kind of a slide than it is to not be able to stop. You know, because if you shall not be able to stop, you might surely die. That's the way things happen whenever your brake pads fall out too, by the way, so be careful with that. Uh, if the pressure in the front brake circuit drops, the higher pressure in the rear brake circuit causes the valve to shift position, and that opens a bypass around the proportioning valve. That's pretty much what that's for. All right, we're getting close to the end here. We don't have much left, so I'm trying to move fast enough where you guys don't turn into a bunch of skeletons. You can have a leak and power brake booster. The welding instructor we used to have, he had a little S10 pickup, and he was, he was a workaround kind of a guy. The transmission got to where it wouldn't back up on that thing, but it worked fine in forward gears. For two or three years, he drove it 
And every time he pulled into Hardy's or anywhere, he had to find a place to park where he wouldn't have to back up. That's where he could just drive straight out. His brake booster quit working. And he needed a brake booster. And he just got used to using his big old muscled up leg to stop that thing. But when we finally changed his brake booster, I told him, Jackie, you won't have to apply as much brake now to stop the truck. Well, the first time I heard him stop, he went, because <laughs> he was used to having, you know, having, having to apply that much. Okay, you can have worn linings, obviously, worn pads. Uh, you got your parking brake right here, a little secondary pedal. Oh, yeah. Corroded or misadjusted brake parking cable. We did a Ranger in here one time. Uh, it, it kept growing, uh, you know, uh, ears and horns and a tail and all that stuff. Because it, what happened was apparently this guy had driven this thing through a lot of creeks and the park brake cables were locked up because they were all rusted up and everything. So we had to wind up having to replace the park brake cable. That's no fun. We got all that stuff done. I had this Volkswagen Bug one time that would, uh, on those old Volkswagen Bugs, the master cylinder was right down here, you know, really low, and the pedals, you know, hinged, you know, from the floor. And uh, it had a master cylinder reservoir. It was a little bitty, uh, small, square plastic reservoir, and it had a little line that went through a, popped into a rubber grommet on a master cylinder. That line went about that long, and it kept losing fluid. You know, and anytime something's losing brake fluid, you gotta say you don't think about it sometimes until your brakes kind of don't work. You know, so I go pulling in here. Oh, heck, this was in 1980. I go pulling in there at this convenience store where my wife was working at the time, and I go to pull the uh, mash the brake, and all of a sudden I realized that the last brake brake application I had brakes, and this time I didn't have any. So I yanked up on the park brake, and the park brake cable broke. No. And I jumped a curb and ran into a newspaper machine and squished it up against the wall. You know? <laughs> well, anyway, and it sort of bent the front of the Volkswagen in. Well, I got and chained it in the back of my truck and I backed up and went boom, pulled it back out like it was supposed to be. And after that, the brakes never leaked again. <laughs> Strange thing. All right, so you can have other brake problems like a restricted or leaking brake line. How's that going to play out? What happens here is I'm hitting the brake. The truck starts to pull when I hit the brake, and then it sort of straightens out. It stops straight. You got me? It starts to pull, and then it stops straight. What that is, you got brake hoses going out there. How many of you guys know that when you're pulling a caliper off to, to, to do the uh, pads, you don't let the caliper hang by the hose? Heck no. You don't do that. I mean, I, I always hammered on that. Make you some S hooks out of wire, do whatever you have to, get coat hangers, get some old pieces of brake line and use your brake tube inventor to bend them into an S. That is really handy to have those right there in your box because you can just hang them up. They actually make some, I think a tool truck sells, you know, things for that. But you can walk through just about any dealership out here and you'll see guys all up and down the line that are working on brakes that have calipers hanging by the hoses. You're not supposed to do that. It begins to tear the hose on the inside, and then all of a sudden here you've got this hose which is a flexible thing for, for, for steering. The hose starts to come apart on the inside, begins to restrict fluid flow, and then you don't have a nice even stop and all that. Yeah. I came to O'Reilly's one time, and he's like, hey, can you come look at this and see if it's supposed to do this? And he goes and he grabs that rubber hose on the thing and pulls it off. Huh? I was like, is that supposed to come off like that? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and you sold him a hose. Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not a all right, you got proportioning valve that can be bad. Metering valves that can be bad. You can have brake uh, pedal push rod or turn spring or bushing problems. Uh, you can have uh, leaking wheel cylinders, drum brake water scored, you know, all of the stuff that you can see, right? Okay, so let's move on here. Make sure you fully understand the symptom. Do not, whenever somebody's coming over here, like they come over here and they say, Melissa, I've got a problem with this noise and they describe some kind of a nebulous noise and customers a lot of the times aren't good at using the right words. You ever heard somebody say that uh, when I pull up to the traffic signal my car knocks off? You ever heard that? <laughs> that means that it stalls. I mean that's a strange thing that they say but I heard this one woman she would say my car keeps knocking off. You know and, and I, I don't know I mean you know knocking you think knocking knocking and she heard a noise but she's knocking off just means it quits. I guess it's like knocking off at the end of the workday. I don't know. But the long and the short of it, you hear other people, if you don't know what they're talking about, the noise they're feeling or the, the concern they're expressing, you better have them ride with you and say, that's what I'm talking about. Because I found myself in a position where I wasn't able to ride with them, 
and I found a noise that really, really irritated me to no end. But the long and the short of it was when the smoke cleared, I was basically um, fixing the wrong thing. And so they come back and pick the car up, and they and I'll, they say, this car is still just like it was. I say, well, wait a minute, I fixed this noise. Oh, I heard that noise, but I wasn't worried about it. I was worried about this other noise. Well, I worked on it two hours. And now they're not wanting to pay because they didn't. you didn't fix what they were wanting fixed, even though they never told you. You're going you with that. So you better make doggone sure you understand what their symptom is. That's not just in noises, it's also in the way things feel and the, their perceived you know, perception of the problem. Uh, then determine which system on the vehicle is going to be causing it. That's something else you got to do. Okay, I'm feeling this, so what is it that's causing this? And you can sometimes tell if the engine, well like the other day, whenever, uh, and, uh, and Melissa was pretty sharp, you know, we out here listening to this ticking noise on this Jeep. And I said, well, it's a strange ticking noise. It sounds like something. I said, well, let's pull the belt off and see if the uh, noise goes away. See, we're trying to determine if it's in the front end accessory drive, which is your, where your belt and pulleys are, or if it's actually somewhere else. So we pulled it off. When you first started it, it wouldn't make the noise, but it would start making it. And it started making the noise with the belt off. So what that tell you? It means it's not in the front end accessory drive. And Melissa says, and her infinite blonde-headed wisdom. She got a little smarter when she got her hair done blonde. She said, why don't we pull the dipstick out and just see what kind of oil is in it? What? No oil on the dipstick? Do you suppose that might have something to do with this ticket? It didn't sound like a lift trick. It was a chain noise, which is going to happen on those with the timing chain. Anyway, so we did an oil change and all that ticket noise went away. Now Melissa put the belt on wrong so the air conditioner didn't work and I did have to fix that so she, you know, she wasn't right about everything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well I had to make sure you didn't get to begin. Okay. Determine the component within that system that's faulty. See what I'm saying? So you gotta basically use a logical troubleshooting procedure instead of, you know, saying I think I'll do this and I think I'll do that. Alright. And then determine what caused the component to fail. If you don't do that, you could have one coming back with the same component failing again. If it has failed repeatedly, you need to find out why it has failed repeatedly. Like the guy I told you about that the wheels were coming off of his Jeep, or his left front wheel was coming off. Sends me an email, my left front wheel keeps coming off. And I torque the stew out of the things and they still come off. And I torque them and they still come off. Using the wrong lug nuts. Long lug nuts, that's what I told him. I said, take a lug nut from each one of the other wheels and put on it and then take one of the lug nuts that's not coming loose and go get some just like that and you'll be okay. Well see, he gets, uh, his deal was, the symptom was the tire was coming off, his fix was tighten the lug nuts, but it kept reoccurring. Okay, you see what I'm saying? You gotta find out what's causing it, what the reason is for it. Verify the concern, what does that mean? Either drive it with them or drive it yourself. I hear the noise, now I know what it is we're supposed to be fixing. No one understand it. Perform a visual inspection. That's the first thing you're going to do. What do I see? If it's an intermittent problem, don't get your hands all over it because you may fix it without knowing what you fixed. You got me? If it's intermittent, don't touch it. Just get your flashlight and look. Got it? All right. Check fluid level and condition. This is an obvious thing. It's part of your visual inspection. Recreate it by operating the vehicle. You know, you're basically just trying to make sure you know what's going on. Check the vehicle repair history, TSPs. That right there is an acronym forehead for Online Automotive Service Information System. That's what OASIS means. So basically it will give you the history on that car as, as, as much as it was available. Remove all wheels and inspect the brake assemblies. That's what you do. You pop those wheels off and you look at the brakes, you're going to know more when you get through with that inspection than you will uh, by doing anything else. But if you see fluid leaking anywhere, if you see stuff that's obviously messed up, you need to address that first. And you have to fix what you find before you can verify a repair. You got me? And your service advisor, they're going to say, you're going to say, well, you need this and this. And they say, well, is that all it's going to need? Well, you don't know until you make that repair and see. You know what I'm saying? All right. Here's your mechanical possibilities. We're almost through here. Brake master cylinder, brake caliper piston, disc brake rotors, wheel bearings. Wheel bearings. Wheel bearings can be loose. And when you're driving, they can push that caliper piston back in and you match the brake, you got almost no brake, and then you hit it again and it comes back out. But see if your wheel bearings are letting it wobble around, it can cause you to have no brake sometimes. 
brake shoes and landings, brake drum. You can actually have the brakes, the rear brakes maladjusted. If somebody comes and says, I hit the brake once, I hit it again, it doesn't really feel like it's got air in it because it's firm every time I hit it, but the second application it comes up. Adjust the rear brakes if you have something like that going on. There's a worksheet on that. Vacuum hose, tires, debris, parking brake switch, and that's electrical stuff. Damage or corroded wire harness, brake cell, master cylinder fluid level switch, stoplight switch. All right. Now right here you got brakes, polar drift. Look at air pressure, wheel alignment, brake pads, brake shoes, brake component, suspension component. And there's your pinpoint test if you want to use the pinpoint test. Red brake warning indicator always on. See, this is some of the stuff. Brake pedal goes down fast. Master cylinder, air in system, fluid level, normal, rear end lock brake or ABS function. You know, and that's you know, going to be sort of... There was one one time, the wheel speed sensors are what tells it when to activate the ABS. If it sees a wheel sliding, it's going to isolate the brake going to that one. It's sliding, and it's going to, you know, machine gun it. There was a Thunderbird that went through uh, this one guy would ride and whenever he drove it, he hit the brake and it, it went through a red light because the ABS system was falsely activating because the little sensor ring came loose from the wheel and the wheel was still rolling but the sensor ring stopped and the wheel speed sensor stopped delivering a speed signal and the ABS stopped the fluid going to that wheel and he was standing on the brake and it was bouncing against his foot and he went right on through the intersection. Wow. You know, cars, mom, you know, all that stuff. And there was another guy I heard of that was doing that on a, a Continental. And I told him, go to the Lincoln Mercury place, because you're driving a Mercury anyway, and get him to replace that wheel speed, I mean, that part that's got that sensor ring on it. So he goes up there, and they put a master cylinder and all kinds of stuff on it before they found it. They wouldn't listen to anything I told him. That's the end, guys. Okay, so everybody has all the answers to your test, right? You got it? All right, let's talk about that right quick. All right. All right, let me see here. Let me get up here where I can read the questions with you. How about that? Is that good? Okay, uh, let's see. Oh my goodness, this is going to be lots of fun, isn't it? You got that? You got the rubber parts and all that? Uh, it's good practice. Let's say brakes test 1A. You got those two? What's the rubber parts of an automotive brake system, you know? Yeah, you got seals, you got pistons, you got boots, and all that. Uh, minimum standards for brake fluid set by the U.S. Department of Transportation is dot three. Yeah, well, the minimum standard is dot three, right? Okay. Some wheel cylinders and calipers can be honed to remove minor surface flaws. Well, that's true. Uh, minor surface flaws is the key word there. Technician A says always remove and discard about two thirds of the fluid in the master cylinder prior to raising a vehicle. Uh, technician B says you should always mark rotors and drums prior to removal. Make sure they're installed the same location during assembly. Both of those guys are right because what happens when you push those caliper pistons back in? How many of you have done that and seen brake fluid dripping on the floor? Got it. Got it. Pascal's law has four basic basic premises. What do you think? <coughs> basically, the uh, you know there's you know I don't ever memorize those, but basically fluid can't be compressed. That's one of them, right? That's the most important one. And also, if you've got, uh, you know, the, the, the difference in the size between the input piston and the output piston is basically going to be, it determine the force and the uh, amount that it moves and all that. And um, don't worry a whole lot about those four basic premises of Pascal's Law, although you might want to go ahead and memorize those so you'll know them better than me because I have never been able to pull those up off the top of my head. Why does air in a hydraulic system keep the system from working as designed? Because air compresses and it keeps it. Every brake service, all drums and rotors must be measured. Not every brake service. It depends on what you're doing with them. But if you're maybe replacing linings or pads, you better measure those dadgum things. And I've got a special tool in there for measuring drums that I'll show you guys how to read. The action of a slide and disc brake caliper can be compared to a what? A C-clamp. That's right. Now let's whip through this one here. Uh, it's good shop practice to fill the brake fluid reservoir above the line marked max. I leave it at, at max or below. That's just a smart way to do it. When service and brakes support the vehicle with floor jacks, what the Sam Hill is that all about? I say it says floor jacks. I would say jack stands. Jack I don't like that word. Dot five brake fluid can damage paint on vehicles. It won't. Dot, dot five won't won't damage paint on vehicles, but dot three will. Yeah. But I will tell you this. 
I, one of the things that ticked me off about that is when I want to demonstrate that to somebody, if I, yeah, if I take an old fender that don't matter and I spill some brake fluid on it, it never hurts the paint. But if it's a nice brand new GTO, it's going to just eat the paint right off of it. So just, and here's something else. If you get brake fluid on the paint, don't wipe it off with a rag. Like, let's say you realize you've got a drop of brake fluid sitting on the paint. Don't wipe it with a rag. Hit it with a water hose. Because if you do that, you'll wash the brake fluid off, and you probably won't damage the paint unless it has already eaten through. But if you wipe it, you're going to have a smear if it has started to deteriorate the paint. Just hit it with a water hose. That's what you need to do. Um, hydraulic pressure can be lost if brake fluid evaporates. Well, well, I mean, any fluid can evaporate. You know, steel will evaporate if you get it to 3,000 degrees. Uh, to obtain a medium weight fluid, mix DOT3 and DOT5. You know, ever mix anything. Because DOT5 brake fluid is polyglycol based, it's less likely to absorb moisture. Uh, well, I mean, polyglycol sounds like antifreeze, doesn't it? Yeah. All right. Brake pedal fade can occur when brake fluid boils. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's going to go down. Brake, uh, parking brakes are an example of static friction at work. Wait a minute. Static friction means nothing's moving. Right? Static is right. Dynamic means you get moving stuff. Disc brake pads clamp against a rotating brake drum, and electronics will play an important role in future braking systems. All right, flip that page over on the back side. Friction can be increased by what? What do you think? Increasing the load. Got it? Newer dual brake systems use one, uh, use uh, what? One hydraulic system to control the two left wheels and another to control the true right, right? One hydraulic system to control the right front and the left rear, and another to control the front and the right rear. That's pretty common. Have two pistons and one fluid reservoir and are only used in recently manufactured trucks. Um, yeah, that's going to be a B. Why should you not use compressed air to clean dust from brakes? Brake linings may contain asbestos, okay? okay. Uh, parking brakes are usually what? Yes, rear wheels. Well, are they usually engaged when the engine stops? No. <laughs> uh, brake fluid must not do what? That's a hard question, isn't it? It must not A, act as a lubricant, B, absorb moisture, B, compatible with metals in the brake system or have a high boiling point. It must not absorb moisture. I mean, the brake fluid has a tendency to absorb moisture, but you don't want it to. And that's the point of that question. Do not leave the brake fluid cap off. In the, on, on the bottle that we have out here in the shop, these gallons of brake fluid, don't leave that off because it absorbs moisture out of the air and then you wind up with, you know, moisture in the brake fluid. Yeah. You got that?